So for day two of our class, we're going to focus more on CSS. Um, the first day of class was HTML, which was our content layer. Remember that buzzword, content layer? Today we're going to focus on the presentation layer, which is CSS. And the next time we'll have a day where we focus on JavaScript, which is our behavior layer. I'll make some notes and such in a moment. But today's big idea will be to use, a, to use CSS. Now CSS doesn't do very much without HTML. So we're going to get a little practice again to create a very basic, very quick 10-line web page, and then we'll start adding CSS to it. So what you want to do here is go to your Start menu. On the bottom left, launch Start, and search here for Notepad++. Let's launch Notepad++. Again, if you're comfortable with Sublime Text or Brackets or Text Wrangler or whatever, you can use it. Visual Studio, Eclipse, etc. Uh, what you want to do is, in this class, we're going to focus on Notepad++ because it's free. You can download it from the Notepad website, and it's a really nice lightweight editor. So go ahead and launch Notepad. Any editor that you want to use is fine, but some of them are way too bulky for the task. You know, Eclipse is great software, but it's huge. It's got way too much stuff just to use for a little HTML. Same thing with Visual Studio. Now, Microsoft has released a lightweight code editor called something like Visual Editor Code, something like that. It's a very lightweight editor. But we've got Notepad++. This is what we'll use. Go ahead and launch Notepad++. Let's go up to the File menu. New. Let's create a new file. And then we'll go to File, Save As. This tripped up a couple of people. When we did Save As last time, you also need to remember to set this as Save As Type HTML. So do that first. You want to Save As HTML. We'll put today's date on it. And I'm going to pop in my flash drive and save it. If you don't have a flash drive, you can save to the desktop. But you have to take the file with you before you leave, or else you will lose it. Remember, deep freeze. So we will save this as HTML, hypertext markup language. I'm saving it to my flash drive. I'm going to put it in the network folder later on if you want to copy. And I'm just putting today's date. So it's the 11th. <coughs> so I have a brand new empty document. And so this will be our brand new project for the day. And what we'll do is we'll set up, we can set up uh, our basic structure in about 10 lines. So first line here, we need to define the doc type. All right, so we've got doc type HTML. We did that previously. We're going to redo a few of these things again. Remember to zoom in. If you need to zoom into your code, you can do control. This is our doc type. We're defining that this is an HTML5 compliant document. We then need the tags of HTML. <coughs> so most of our tags, as you recall, have a pair, HTML slash HTML. Inside the pair, we had head. That was a pair. And we had body. Let's go ahead and do that. HTML tags, head tag, oops, body tags, pairs. That should not be new. We did that last time. And remember the promise of the class is we're making a web app. We're making a website in the beginning, month one. And then we're making that, we're going to upgrade that to an Android app. And I'll show you uh, the examples again. We saw them last time, but I'll show you some other examples also of what you can accomplish with what we're learning here. We're taking a humble web project, part one, month one, and then in part two, we're converting it into the Android app, 
The same code that we're writing here could go to Android, could go to iPhone, could go to Windows Phone, Blackberry, Firefox OS, whatever. But we have to start with this core code first. Let's back up to the head. We're adding another tag. We're adding one of the tags at the meta tag because then we're defining what our character set is. Remember this attribute, car set, or char set if you want to say it wrong. Uh, UTF-8, meaning we can use just about every alphabet. English, Spanish, German, Cyrillic, Hebrew, Japanese, etc. In the head tag, we will also write, or in the head section, we will also write the title tags. Quick reminder, I forgot. What does the title tag do again? Puts the title in the, the, the title in the tab, yes. It puts the title at the top of the screen in our web browser. This is something vis visible to people. Everything that we've done so far has not been visible to people, but it's part of our structure. And here we will just write um, focus on CSS. We'll write day two, focus on CSS. Content, as we saw previously in the head tag, uh, except for a few, um, a few specific examples, doesn't show up for the regular user. What shows up in the regular user is in the body section. So inside a body, we'll go into body and we'll write a heading one tag. Remember that's a one, not an L, H1. And we'll just write um, cascading style sheets. That's what CSS stands for. What does it mean and what does it do? We'll get to that. Just like we talked about that HTML is hypertext markup language. ML, the markup language is that we marked this tag between this tag, do this. This tag between that tag, do that. That was the markup. And HT, hypertext, which was basically links. We made a link from our document to my website. That was a link. HTML. CSS, cascading style sheets. I'll explain it in detail in just a bit. But at this point, 10 lines, this is a web page. This is a fully functional, fully formed web page, website. I want to see my results. So remember, our workflow is we type some code, we save the code, we run the code. I haven't saved yet because the floppy disk is red. Remember to save your work. Click on the Save icon or Control S or File Menu Save. Save your work and then run. I choose any web browser, but I'm going with Firefox because it's the first one on the list. And the keyboard shortcut is Control Alt Shift X. So Control, uh, it's going, it's going back actually. So just the row behind you over there, I guess. So launch in Firefox, Control, Alt, Shift, X, Chrome, whatever you'd like. But I'm going to launch that. And at this point, it should look like this. So here we are so far. That's what that looks like. Let's pause here. Does everyone have that? Anyone need any help? So this is not new. We did all of this previously. But let's make sure it should look how I expect it. Problems, of course, could be you misspelled your tags. Some tags can be misspelled somewhat, and they still work, and some tags don't work. One of the things I mentioned briefly that I'll mention a little bit more in detail this time is uh, comments. The question was asked about comments, and I briefly mentioned it. I'll mention it again. Comments are special tags that we write to give ourselves comments, to give ourselves notes in the project. So if I'm working on this myself, and I put it down, and I come back a week, or a month later, or whatever, I might forget what I did. So I can write myself notes in my code, notes that the web browser will ignore. If I'm working in a team, notes are very good too, because then I can leave a note for the other person working to say, don't forget to fix this. So let's write a note here. Uh, let's go before the end of line 10. Give yourself a new line 10. 
this one's a very unique pair of tags. I have the opening and the closing angle. And whatever we put within those two tags, there is a comment. So I'm going to write here um, single line comment example. So that's easy. We're writing a comment and it's going to the single line. <coughs> What I mean by this is we can write a comment in one line like that, or we can break it up into multiple lines. And in HTML, we use the same tag. We'll see when we get over to CSS and JavaScript. There's actually two ways to comment. And we'll get to that. Let's go to line 11, and let's write, that, let's write this comment But what I'm getting at is that I can use this tag for a single line, or I can use it for a multiple line, like this. If I break that into multiple lines, that works too. Multiple line comment example. What's the point of this? I can write multiple lines. I started the tag here, I ended the tag there. I started the comment tag there, ended it here, multiple lines. So that's useful when we have to write a block of comments. Now that we know that, we will write a real comment at the bottom. But we're going to write name, project, date, version. We're going to fill in a little bit of basic info about the project here. Uh, now, where did the uh, sign-in sheet go? Did everyone uh, get a chance to sign it? Did it, everyone sign it? You guys missed it? Okay, don't forget to get it. It's right behind you. So oftentimes we can use the comment like this. We can write a little block of, you know, about us information. So here under, under this stuff, we'll, we'll fill it in a bit. And uh, this is completely optional. It doesn't matter for the grand scheme of things. But it's useful when you're working in a team or if yourself, you put the project down, pick it up later, which is what I did earlier today. I was updating one of my apps and I needed to get back in. And what did this thing do again? Good thing I left a comment. Um, and so what I'm going to do here is this, is, this is also just another bit of style, because if I start writing a name here, and I start writing something here, and I start writing something here, you know, it, I wrote it, but it doesn't look so nice. So what I like to do is just tab things over so that they line up nicely. That's obviously completely optional, but it keeps it looking nicely aligned and professional. So we're going to write some stuff, and I'm just going to tab it over, and you can do that if you want or not. But oftentimes you'll see code like this so that it looks nice. So let's fill it in. Your name. The project is intro to CSS. Today's date. This is version whatever we want here. 1.0. Sure. Any version numbers will work. <coughs> So these are examples of comments. They may seem superfluous. Yes, um, keyboard shortcut for the multi line comment. Keyboard shortcut for what? Multi line. Multi -line. Um, uh, maybe, maybe somewhere inside of my. Inside edit, I will look at it, and then there's a control. I can make it work. I make comment, comment. I think you have to select it first. Yeah, so it looks. It work. Let me check it right now. So it looks like we've got the ability to do comments quickly on the menu up here. Edit.
comment. Single line comment. Get the single line. Edit. Comment. Block comment. Edit, comment, block, comment, control, shift, Q, yeah, control, shift, Q. So there we go. There's a quick way to do comments. I, I never do it. I learned something. So uh, you can quickly comment your code up from the edit menu. I guess most software, most editor, code editors will let you do that now, but I forget about it and I do it manually. But there we go. Under edit, comment, you select something. You go to comment, uncomment. You can turn it on or off with some shortcuts. Now the, uh, the use of comments is that we can write notes and such also, but the use of comments is also that you can deactivate code when necessary. So let's say for whatever reason I've got my code and it currently says cascading style sheets, but for some reason let's say I wanted to deactivate that bit of code. I don't want to delete it, but I just don't want to use it anymore. If I add a comment there, if I comment that out and then run my code, it's gone. So I still want that code for some reason. But what I've done is I've commented it instead of deleting it. And so any valid HTML code can be commented out, deactivated, with a comment. You don't have to do this, but I'm just showing you that I commented out my H1, I ran it, and there's nothing there. Nothing vis visible. But technically it's still there. If I were to view source in the web browser, it would still show up. Everything shows up. Okay, so let's also fill in a little bit more content just to uh, have something to work with, and then we'll go right into CSS. Uh, just to play with this, we're also going to have uh, a paragraph. Last time we were breaking up the paragraph into multiple lines. doesn't matter, but I'm going to keep it in one line, and I'm just going to write here, um, <clears throat> we are learning examples of what CSS can do. I'm going to create another h2 down here, or I'm going to create an h2 down here. Let's say uses of CSS. I'm going to create a paragraph and this time break it into multiple lines and then create a bullet point list. I'm going to create a bullet point list. Anyone remember what code that is? Uh, UL unordered list, bullet points. So I'm going to create an unordered list here in a moment. So I'm just filling in some stuff, uh, some content. We're going to use CSS to style it to change the default look of things. I'm going to back up actually. I'm going to add an H3 right below the H2 because this is actually a subsection of content uh, so I'm going to say here, uh, uses, you can use, uh, you can use CSS on text. After the bullet points, I'm going to say also H3 again. Let's say images. Let's just put in a little placeholder text. Alright, so just a little bit of placeholder text. I want to add also a couple of uh, three bullet points here. So our placeholder, our starting um, code of UL, unordered list. So I need to add some bullet point lists, some bullet point items, list items. So I'm going to add tag. And here I can save myself a little bit of typing. 
I'm going to add two more lines list items. I can type them again or copy and paste. Whenever you can whenever you can repeat something or whenever you're going to repeat something, it's a good idea to copy and paste. Mm -hmm. Although it's a better idea if you're copying and pasting the correct code because it's also possible to copy your incorrect code multiple times and then you've made more work for yourself. So make sure you've typed the code properly, li slash li list items and I'm going to add two list items right below. Just copy and paste. The first list item is tag, and we've got class, and we've got ID. At this point, go ahead and save it and run it. We'll make sure we're all in the same place. We've got some text, bullet points, some headings, plain paragraph, etc. Question. How do you do a copy and paste my <laughs> Um, what you can do is you can select what you need and then up on the keyboard or up on the edit we've got edit copy. You notice we've also got control C for copy and paste control V. You just have to first select and then control C, control V. Go ahead and save and run it. Hopefully nothing nothing weird should happen. It should look kind of like what we did previously. Let me check my own code here. It should look something like that. Heading 1, P, heading 2, heading 3, heading 3, uh, unordered list. That's my code so far. Anyone need any help? The point of this is to create content that I can then style. I'm going to write some comments or some notes on another document and I'll make these notes available to you on the network folder later on. So in my notes here, HTML, invented in 1989, hypertext, markup language, CSS, invented in 1996, I believe, cascading style sheets, JavaScript, I believe in 1992, and JavaScript stands for JavaScript. Uh, so, hypertext markup language is our present uh, is our content layer. So structure. CSS is our presentation layer, which is design. And JavaScript is the behavior layer. Question there in the corner, guys. Quick question there. Behavior layer. Interactivity. So reiteration of what we talked about before, but today we're talking to focus specifically on CSS. And CSS, as I said previously, this would be, I would say it's a little bit harder than HTML, simply because I think of CSS as such a, such a puzzle, such a a, a piece of a larger whole um, that you're editing some CSS and it might conflict with other CSS or this CSS here is beholden to that CSS there and it kinda looks weird it doesn't look exactly like I think it does uh, so we're gonna see that sometimes it's not as straightforward as it could be HTML I think comparatively is very straightforward CSS is a little more cumbersome and JavaScript can, com can be completely obfuscated completely complicated and so with CSS, we can apply it in different ways. Um, ways to apply CSS. We have inline, embedded, and external. 
inline is applied directly to elements. <coughs> Embedded is that it is consolidated in one place in your document. And external is consolidated in a separate separate, separate uh, file. So last time we were here we looked very briefly at inline CSS. We applied CSS directly to an element, the heading, uh, the body, the body element, remember? And we turned everything pink or yellow or whatever color you chose. We also have the ability to do embedded, which is basically all of our possible CSS, instead of it being applied to specific elements, are all saved, are all written in one part of our document. We'll see what that means in a moment. Or the third is that we can have all of our code written in a separate file. That separate file is then connected to our current file. For inline, a pro or a positive of it is that it's quick and direct. I need to change something. I edit it directly on that element. It's yellow. Done. <coughs> the con of it is that it's harder to maintain. So harder to edit. Harder to go back to make another change. If you've got 500 lines of code and you've got these code, these little changes strewn throughout your 500 lines, you might have a harder time finding what do I need to change? Where did I put it? So it might be a little harder to maintain because it's it could be strewn about your document. For embedded, a pro is that it's consolidated in that it's all in one chunk, in one block in your code. You might have 500 lines of code, but you're going to be sh uh, assured that all of your possible code is in one section. You've got 500 lines of code, but the first 20 lines are your CSS. So you can easily find it there always. It's consolidated into one place. A con of that is that it requires a little, a little bit more setup needs a bit more setup. We'll see what that means later. But it needs a little bit more setup for that to fully work. And then with external, the pro of that, it's consolidated also, but I guess a way to say it is that it is um, accessible, or let's say fully accessible. By all documents because the previous two, I'll, I'll add a con in a moment, the previous two cons are that they are only accessible by the current document. If I have an about page, about document, and a shop document, and a home document, I've got three different documents, and if I write inline or embedded CSS in the home document, it's only applying to the home document. The background becomes pink only in the home document. It doesn't become pink in the about document, in the contact document. That's what inline and embedded, that's one of their downsides as well. Whatever change you make only applies to that one document. If you put your code in an external document, you can link that to all your documents, and all your documents can access that yellow, that pink, that blue, that that drop shadow, that rounded corner, etc. So this method, uh, the big positive is that all your documents can access it. They all go back to that well and drink from it. They all get the, the, the styling from that one document. And then the con of this one, I would also say that it needs setup, but then it also uh, must be properly linked. You've got this document right here, which is HTML, plain. And I've got this document over here, which has my style. These two better be linked, or it won't work. And if you mistype your code to link it from here to here, it doesn't work. And now your document is plain. 
what if something happens and this file gets corrupted? Now your design doesn't doesn't work anymore. You lose all of your all of your colors, all of your alignment, all of your columns, all of that design, the presentation layer. So that is a drawback there. It's a separate file to worry about. If that file gets damaged or lost or erased or edited incorrectly, it could damage or it could uh, affect your HTML file. So this is the dry stuff of it. These are various basic concepts of CSS. We'll get back to our code and start to make, start to apply this now. But any questions so far? Okay, so let's go back to our code here, and uh, we'll play with the three different kinds. Uh, we'll play with the basic one first, the inline one. We'll do that again, like we did previously, just for practice. I want to edit one more time the body. I want to change the background color from a basic color to my color. And I want to add more CSS, not just what the one thing we did last time. I want to add more. So remember, this works by adding the style attribute. Just like we've got the car set attribute, we need an attribute here. So inside of the body tag, press a space after the Y, still inside the angle brackets. And we will add the style attribute. That means CSS, basically. Why is it not spelled CSS? I don't know. When they invented this, they never had that great idea. They called it style. So style. And here then we can choose from a list of 200 CSS um, selectors, 200 CSS codes um, that'll make this work. And here's one of them, which we saw previously, background-color. We'll choose any color. This time I'll go with maybe... Let's choose the coolest color of all, black. Let's give ourselves a very cool black background. This is CSS. We've added style. We've um, changed the look of the basic document. Body, by default, has a white background. Now we've chosen black. Let's see the result. Go ahead and save it and run it. Notice the syntax. Background. It's all over the case as always. Background dash color, and there is a difference actually between the British and the English spelling of color. We want the English, uh, the American spelling of color. Colon, space, value, semicolon. What does it look like? It just doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't recognize it. Here we go. None more black. So, okay, I got a black background, but I didn't say anything about my black my text, did I? My text is still there. If you click and drag, you can select it. It's still there. It's just this black text on a black background. Invisible. Do you think we have a way to change our text color? Yes. Yes, we better. So let's write some CSS code to change the color of our text. And in 1996, when this was being invented, it was a great idea to, uh, to add a property here to change the, the text color. And when we want to change more than one CSS rule, what we need to do is we need to have a semicolon between each thing we're trying to change. That's why that semicolon is there, because that's like the end of that command, so to speak. So we'll add a space right after that semicolon. And now we're going to change the text color. And since we have background-color, it would make perfect sense that we would have something called text-color. But unfortunately, when this was being invented, no one had that great idea. <laughs> there is no text color. It's simply color. Color means text color. No one had the idea to say text-color will be the text color. And it works the same way. Color, colon, space, and let's do white, semicolon. So go ahead and try that. You should have no more invisible text. So if I save and run that, there we go. White text on a black background. Now that we know those two 
properties of CSS, let's get a little creative then. Choose your own colors. Choose your own background color, your own text color. Remember, we can go back to the w3schools.com website to, to, get, uh, uh, to get color combinations. Um, I'm going to do a quick sidetrack on that. w3schools.com. Under the references, you can go look at HTML color reference. Uh, and then specifically on the left, color names, if you want to. And here we've got all of these different colors. Cyan, dark blue, dark cyan, which is greenish to me. Dark green, dark gray, there's dark gray and dark gray, which I really like to spell it. Crimson, etc. So pick a couple of colors, make them up, or go to this list here. We've got linen. It looks kind of dirty. Uh, moccasin, misty rose, etc. Rebecca purple. So if you if you go to W3 schools, you will see um, those color those color options, but you will also see uh, on the side you can see uh, mix mixes and shades. So if I want to start with a certain color like papaya whip, and then go over to mix, I can mix colors here, and it'll give me the color code. I'll say I want that color right there. So it gives you that color code. Now We can apply CSS to just about any element. We've applied it to the body element, the body tag. I might use those words in interchangeably, element or tag, or even object sometimes. So the body element, the body tag, I've redefined the default look. It used to be black text, white background. Now it's, in my case, pink background, brown text. If, I, if it's true what I just said, that I can apply CSS to just about any element, let's see what happens when we apply it to the H1 element. Let's go to line 8, and if your lines don't line up with mine, that's okay. Uh, but somewhere where you've got your H1 tag, let's go to H1, and let's add style to H1. Same as before. All right, everyone, remember to mute your devices, please. Style equals quote, end quote. same sort of thing here, background color, color. Let's pick another combination of colors. We're adding CSS specifically to H1. We're writing uh, inline CSS. Remember that I said inline embedded external. We're writing inline CSS. We're adding it directly to elements. Background dash color. I'll try this time bisque color um, dark cyan Okay, so I'm changing this a bit. Whatever colors you'd like, go ahead and save it and run it. You should then now see that on that element, we've applied CSS. We've changed 
this one element. Look at that. So everything else obeys pink and brown, but now this one element is bisque and dark cyan. All right, so did everyone get that? Did you change your colors? Can you go back to your course, All right, so this is an example of inline CSS. And CSS is not just limited to colors. CSS can be used for many other design choices. So I'm going to try this. Go back to body. I'm going to go back to the style attribute. We're going to add a brand new CSS property. So these are properties. And then these are property values. The background property, the color property. Question? Um, after the color and before cascading, you have a uh, close bracket. What line? Uh, eight. Uh huh. And then after the cascading stone. Yeah, because we need to we need to close the H one. Okay, so after the semicolon of your text color um, property value we're going to add another CSS property. This is a property that's not related to color because it's not just color that we can affect. We can affect many, many things. Here's one thing that we can affect. Add the CSS property text dash align colon space. And now we're going to add a value here. We're dealing with something called text align. You might, by its name, get a sense of what it'll do. But here then, I will add the value center. Text align center. Go ahead and save and run it and see what happens. Text the line center. We've made everything centered. All the text has been centered and with one line, one little line of code, right? So here we're seeing that it's not just for color and such. We can deal with uh, elements of design and we'll get more complex, of course. Here's what I've got so far. All my text has been aligned to the center of my document. And the cool thing is that if I uh, resize my web browser, it still stays in the center. We can use CSS to edit things like that. We can also use CSS for placement and such. Let's explore that a little bit. Let's go back to line 8, where we've got our style for heading 1. And what we'll do after the, after the last property here, which is color, we'll add a new property, so add a space after the semicolon. So you, you need to get used to this, that it is a colon and then a semicolon. If you put two colons, it won't work. When it doesn't work, it'll just go back to plain. If you put two semicolons, that won't work either. It'll get confused and you'll get no result, just plain defaults. So whenever something is not understood, it just goes back to the defaults. Uh, let's add this other property here. Uh, we have the ability to do something where we add a little bit more uh, space around elements. So let's type margin colon. And we need to say how much space around our, our element. In my book here, for example, I've got I've got some big bold text at the top and it, there's a little bit of space above it. Right? There's some margin around that element. 
so that it's not all bumping into each other. Basically, that's what margin does. So we need to see how much margin, and we have various ways to do this. Let's do 25 px semicolon px, pixels, which are dots, basically, dots on the screen. Let's save it and run it, and let's see what that looks like. Margin colon space 25px. Notice there's no space between the, the number and the unit of measurement. Don't put a space there. It needs to be together, 25px. And then it ends. before and after. Very subtle, but on the left side I'm seeing a little bit of extra space on the left side, and on the top I'm seeing a little bit of space, and on the right also. Let's make it more obvious. Let's make it really obvious. 125. Just to put something. Let's try 125 pixels. What will that look like? With the particular size of my screen, I've got 125 pixels margin all around my element. So in my case, it looks like that. If I had my screen maximized, it's not so, it's not, it's not so extreme, but I still have 20, 125 at the top and the left and the right and the bottom of that element. I've put in padding on all four sides. I've, I've um, I've worked here now with something known as the box model. Everything in HTML basically is in an invisible box. That heading one is an invisible box. It has four sides. Top, right, bottom, left. Four sides. And so with CSS here I've said let's change that so that we add 125 pixels instead of the defaults on all four sides. Let's do this. Let's back up to put it to 25px, still within, we're still gonna, we're still gonna change the margin property, but now we're gonna change its value. Let's keep it at 25px, and then add a space. Notice my space is still before the end of the semicolon. And then let's add 75px, space, um, 55 px space and 100 px space. Just choosing some values. I'm putting four values. Oops, sorry, here we do not want this semicolon right there. We want the property and its values. Four values 25 px space, 75 px space, 55 px space, 100 px semicolon. The end. So we want these four values. Go ahead and save it and run it and check the result. So if this worked, I specified four values. I've got here what I've said, 25 pixels at the top, 75 pixels at the right, 55 pixels at the bottom, and 100 pixels at the left. Top, right, bottom, left, in that order. Top, right, bottom, left, clockwise, starting from noon. So the first value is the top, the second is the right, the third one is the bottom, and the fourth one is the left, in that order. The box model. I have four sides of this box, and so I can specify each side independently. When I, when I wrote one value, it applied that one value to all sides. 
when I specify all four values, it applies it to every, every one of the four sides. And we've got shortcuts where we can say, for, for example, make the top and the bottom the same value, and make the left and the right the same value. And that shortcut is if you specify two values. So if I take it back to say 25px space 75px, what I'm saying there is make the top and bottom 25 pixels, and the left and right 75 pixels. One value applies to all four sides. Four values apply to four sides. Two values apply to the top and bottom and the left and right at the same time. So now I've got only 25 pixels on top and bottom and 75 on left and right. Let me back up a little bit over here. Before we added those properties, remember this, before I added the, the margin property, the color, the color, the background color extended all the way to the end, from left to right. Right, it went all the way to the end. After then I started to mess with the margins and such, it didn't extend as much because we've got that dead space, sort of, that margin. So, on, for example, this, this sign-in sheet here, there's a little bit of dead space, a little bit of margin all around it. There's like a quarter of an inch all the way around it on all four sides. If you were writing a, a college term paper, they want one-inch margins. So I need f uh, one inch on all four sides. That's margin. Margin on a page, margin on a web page. So here I've set the margin, and therefore I've pushed elements inside. My, my color does not extend all the way to the end like it did previously like that. And even then, at that point, if you look carefully, it still doesn't extend all the way to the end. This is back before I added any margin. It still didn't extend all the way because there were defaults. Remember what I said, there's always defaults. The default of H1 had an invisible box there all along. But when I added that background color, it put a color and it showed me the box, but the default does not go all the way to the end. This is why we're going to see that I think CSS is a little harder than, than HTML, because there's oftentimes a default that either gets in our way or does something different, and we have to counteract it or add to it or nullify it, then it takes a little bit more effort. Yes? It's not really a good idea to think about how many pixels equals an inch because they're so fluid. I can create 72 pixels on this monitor that is one inch, but then those same 72 pixels on my mobile will be much larger. And those 72 pixels that seem to be one inch on my screen here are as big as my hand on my projector. So it's not a good idea to think how inches and pixels apply because it's so fluid. But that's a good point here. We are dealing with a unit of measurement of pixels, which are dots. If we wanted to, we could put inch. I don't recommend putting 25 inches of margin here, but for fun, let's change this to, I don't know, 2 inch, 1 inch. So we have a list of possible units here. Pixels is one we will use commonly. Inch we will never use. And I'll mention one or two others that we will use. But just for fun, let's see how that looks. Two inches, one inch. So that'll be two inches top and bottom, one inch left and right. Look at that. There's <laughs> quote unquote two inches. It's bigger than my arm. It's a huge difference. <laughs> Now, on the mobile device, it might be a bit more accurate, but then these things are 4 inches, 6 inch screen, 10 inch screens, tablets, and so forth. So, uh, units of measurement like this, inches, are not a very good one to use because they are um, 
they are a, uh, a, static use, a static unit of measurement. We want instead fluid units of measurement, so we used a uh, uh, we use pixel, which actually is still not a fluid unit of measurement. Um, we can use percentages, 25%, 75%. This one and another one that I will mention are a little better to use most of the time than a hard value like pixels or especially inches because 25% on this projector might look really nice, and 25% on this little screen might look nice, and 25% on that monitor might look nice. It's fluid. It, it changes to the size of the particular device. Baker? Yes? Uh, since we're doing mobile devices, is there one that's preferable, that you think is preferable uh, to percentage rather than pixel? We're going we're gonna to see on a case-by-case -case basis that it's going to depend on, on different things, when to use percentage and when to use pixels. Okay. Um, so right here I put percentage and actually look really weird. Did it look weird to everyone? Two? Okay, so in this case I'm going to just put um, regular pixel values, but let's say we talk about text. We can edit uh, the values of text as well, and we might be used to Microsoft Word or a word processor where we write text and it's 12 points. We can use points also. PTs, points? Oh, like the font. Like fonts. So we can add points as well. But that's also more for print. So percentages, which are fluid, are good. Pixels, as necessary. Points usually aren't so good. Um, inches aren't so good. Centimeters. We could do centimeters, we could do millimeters, but those aren't so good either. Another unit of measurement that is good but might not quite apply in this point here is uh, the unit known as an M. This one, let's be careful about this one. Let's put 2M and 3M. Let's try that one. I'll explain in one moment. Go ahead and type M, save it and run it, and see if you get any difference. The letter E, the letter M, as in mat. <clears throat> so I took these values down to 2 and to 3. If I kept it at 25 or whatever, it would really move it, because an M is a unit of measurement based on the letter M of the font. So the font over here whatever this font is, has a letter M, and it has a certain size inherent. We're saying, give us a margin two times the size of the letter M of that font. Give us a margin three times the size of the letter M of that margin. So on my notes over here, notes on CSS units. PX pixels are often okay to use. Percent, so percentages are often okay to use. And M's, which are uh, sizes based on the letter M capital letter M, of a font are okay to use. And I'll just say not okay down here. Question? Yeah, I mean, the, the font, um, it could be either or because, but since we have not defined any font, it's going to go with the default font of the whole document. But we could define a font just for that element, and then that element's m value is different than the m value of the whole document. So these units here are not okay, usually, to use on a website. Inches. Inches don't matter on the web. Neither do centimeters, neither do millimeters, neither do points. Because these values might not really behave how you think. One millimeter if you're designing your project to be responsive, which is to be 
to look good on a mobile device and a desktop. One millimeter might look great on your particular 7-inch phone, but it'll be tiny on your 19-inch monitor. So these hard values, these hard-coded values, there's another term I'm forgetting, but these values that are static, these are hard values. They don't really change. These change. These are fluid. Well, not pixels, but m's and percentages are fluids, fluid values. Percentage, obviously, 10% of the size of my screen. And m's, think of them as percentages, but they just have a different sort of scale. They're usually whole numbers. 1 is 100%. 2 m's, 200%. Um, 3 m's is 300 percent, but you can also mix and match by doing 1.25 em. That's 125 percent. One25 em is approximately like saying 125 percent. But it's based on the size of the font in question. <coughs> So you can have these fractions in M's. So this is what we've got so far, and I saw here that it kind of did something weird here. It made these bullet points not line up nicely anymore. This is what I'm saying about CSS. It's a big interconnected puzzle. Um, so we would have to deal with that. Uh, but let's take a, a break at this point. We'll keep exploring CSS afterward. It's 710. We'll be back at 720 and we'll go on. By the way,